Today we're going to be looking at critical points and sign charts. This is really important in calculus because it's really important in calculus to know when a function is positive or negative. And so I have a couple graphs here in decimals. Let's look at this. Now on this graph here, we're looking at the x values in which this graph would be positive or negative. And so and one important thing to figure out is, well, when does the graph hit the ground? And at these two spots, the graph will touch the x-axis. Now that's important because those are the places that a function might cross over. Because the function is continuous, it has to cross the x-axis in order to switch signs. You can't just jump across if it's a continuous function. So the idea is that we can kind of divide up the number line into a couple areas. x equals 1, x equals negative 1, and we look at the spaces in between them. From 1 over, we know the function is above, and so that's a positive interval. And then we look at the other intervals, and we know that even though it hits the ground right here, it isn't actually crossing over and going up, it's bouncing down. And so it's negative from negative infinity to negative 1, and negative 1 to 1. Okay. So the idea is similar here. If you're looking at a rational expression, the important places are when it crosses the x-axis, but also you'll notice it switches from negative to positive around this. And so we have three places we could look. At negative 2, at x equals 3, and those are just called vertical asymptotes. And then the other place is at 1, so at x equals 1. Now what this does is these three lines, these points, are splitting up our interval into four regions. And so we could say, all right, negative here, positive here, negative here, positive here. But you'll notice in this case, it wasn't like the last one where we are just looking for where it crosses. We're also looking for any discontinuities like asymptotes. So what does this mean for us? Well, to find the signs of a function, we need to look for what's called critical points. And critical points are when a function is 0 or undefined. Okay. The reason for this, the reason we look for critical points, is that these are the places where the function might switch signs. And we care about the signs here, meaning positive or negative. So if you have a function like this, just a line, the critical point would be right at this c, at x equals c. To the right of it, we would have positive. To the left, our values would be negative. And at c, it's switching. So c is our critical point because it divides the number line into regions where the function is positive and negative. Same thing if you had like a parabola that's smiling, has positive end behavior. We have two different critical points. And that splits up the number line into three regions. Positive over here, negative over here, and positive over here. Okay? And again, it matters if it's undefined because, for example, 1 over x, if you were to look at 1 over x, it never crosses the x-axis, so the function is never 0. But at x equals 0, you have an undefined value. And that's a place where actually this function switches from being negative under the x-axis to positive. Okay, now this is a warning. You have to say the critical points are places where the function might flip over the x-axis. And here's, here's why. Here's why I say that it only might cross over. 1 over x squared looks like this. The function is never 0, but 1 over x squared is undefined at x equals 0. If you look at this, though, we have a positive and a positive, and it never actually flipped. So although 0 is an important point, it's not in the domain, it's a place that we still have to check out to see if the function is switching positive to negative.
Also, similarly with parabolas, sometimes you have a parabola that just looks like this. Okay, the critical point is right there, but on each side of this critical point, my function has not actually crossed the x-axis, it just bounced off. So, again, critical points are where the function might switch signs, and that's when a function is zero or undefined. So, let's do s some examples, like x squared minus 5x plus 4, and the directions might say give positive and negative intervals. So here's where we do a line chart. First of all, we need to figure out what are the critical points. Now right away I'm setting it equal to zero. The reason is I want to know when my function is zero and those will be my critical points. Now in my definition up here I also said undefined, but these polynomials are not going to have undefined points so I'm not going to be looking for those quite yet. So, if I factor this, I get x minus 4 and x minus 1, and so my critical points are 4 and 1. Now what we do is we don't really graph it. We set down a chart like this, and this divides the regions into, the x-axis into three regions. And then we ask ourselves, when will the parabola be the values, the y's, be above or below the line. Now, what you could simply do is you could test 0. So if I put 0 into the function, will I have a positive or a negative answer? So if I put it in here, I actually get 4, which means that on this side, my values are positive. Okay, now if you test like 3, you'll find that the value is negative. 3 in there is 9 minus 15 plus 4. Yeah, that's going to be negative. On the other side, you could also like test 5. 5 is a positive number. So, just with the line test, we can say, when is it, when is this function positive? Well, we know it's from negative infinity to 1. That's this region over here. And, it's from 4 to infinity. That's this region on the right side. When is the function negative? Well, it's 1 through 4. And keep in mind, we're not actually including 1 or 4 because we wanted strictly positive or strictly negative. One note about this, too, is if you know what parabolas look like, this will be extremely helpful for you in the line chart. You can actually get these pretty quick. We don't have to test points if you really understand end behavior. So, as a side note, if you had, again, 1 and 4, and you know the end behavior is positive and positive infinity on both sides, you know it has to end up going up on both sides like this. So these have to be positive intervals. And I know it's continuous and it's crossing the x-axis, so this has to be negative. So, when in doubt, you can test numbers in the function to figure out if they're positive or negative, but from our graphing, a lot of this you should be able to figure out just by using logic. So, let's do another one here. Okay, this is not asking for positive or negative intervals, it's asking when is it less than or equal to zero. So the same rules apply. We're looking for when this function is zero or when it's undefined. And at least for these examples, we don't have any division, so we're not going to run into to undefined. But we do have to know when this is zero. And unfortunately, with a polynomial like this, there's no simple way to factor. We have to go back to synthetically dividing. Now, just a reminder, what do we look at for what possibilities we could divide? Well, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 12, 24. And possible denominators are 1 and 2, so we could also have 1 half, 3 halves, 2 divided by 2 is 1, 4 divided by 2 is 2, 6 divided by 2 is 3, 8 divided by 2 is 4. So we have all of these different possibilities. Now, I'm going to cheat a little bit. In reality, you would have to go through and test a bunch of them, but for the sake of time, I know 4 is going to work here. So let's 
synthetically divide. That would be 1, 4, negative 6, negative 24. Perfect. We're looking for it to divide evenly. So I know x minus 4 and 2x squared plus x minus 6 is the factorization. I know for my line chart, 4 is going to be one of my critical points. But we still have to factor this out. So it's going to be x minus 4. We have to have a 2x and a 1x. And then we have to think about a pair that will work for this factorization. So 1 has to be positive and 1 has to be negative. And we need to have it so that 2 and 3 will add up to be 1. So I'm thinking that this has to be 1 and this has to be 3. We want a positive 3 when we multiply by x, and then we want a negative 2. So normally we don't write 1x minus 1. All right, so we have our critical points from our factorization. We have 1, we have negative 3 halves, and we have 4. OK, so we have four regions to look at. One of the easiest points to pick out is plugging in 0. And that makes sense because that's the y-intercept. If I plug 0 in, I'm going to get 24, so I know this region is positive. All right, another trick I know is that the end behavior is positive, so on the right side it's going to go up, and it's going to snake through, and on the left side it's going down. So I know that this has to be negative on this side, I know this has to be positive here, and you know, just, I know that it's going to snake through kind of like this, and it's not going to bounce, so I know this has to be negative. But if I was ever in doubt, I could use a test point. I could plug 2 into this function and see what I'd actually get. Now it's time to ans actually answer the question, when is it less than or equal to 0? And that's when it's going to be negative. So I'm going to include this interval. And because it's equal to negative 3 halves, I want to include with a square bracket. And over here, I'm going to include 1 and 4 because that's 0 and the negative parts. So negative infinity to negative 3 halves unioned with 1, 4. Now that is when my function is less than or equal to 0. OK, so this is a problem you should try out on your own. The key is, you need to factor so that you know where your critical points are, and then create a line chart to see where are you, where is this function positive or negative. Okay, after going through all the possibilities, like 1, 2, 3, 6, and then 1 half, 2 halves, 3 halves, 6 halves, plus or minus, this is what we should get as our factorization. So I'm kind of jumping all that work, the heavy lifting that you had to do to actually get here. But the point is that we now have critical point of 3, negative 2, and 1 half. OK, thinking about the end behavior of this, we know it's going to go up in the right. It's going to go down on the left. Plugging in 0 as a test point would give me 6, so that's positive. And I know it's negative over here, positive here, negative here, positive here. OK, so when is it greater than or equal to 0? Well, from negative 2 to 1 half inclusive, it's greater than 0. And at these numbers, it's 0. And then 3 to infinity with 3 inclusive would be the other side. So just a word of warning, um, you might end up with cubics that bounce off the x-axis because there's a multiplicity right there. Just be careful about this because you might have to report where you have positive regions. Say this is negative 1 and this is 3. If it's greater than or equal to, or sorry, greater than without equal to 0, and this is f, we want to say from negative 1 to 3, and 3 to infinity, we are excluding 3 here because it's exactly 0 there, and it's strictly greater than. So just be careful when that comes up.